I see some familiar faces, but only from like Zoom. <laughs> because 2019 to 2021, Thomas, I've never seen you in the flesh, but hello, I was one of your <laughs> students. Beatrix, I have met, because she was my supervisor and we were coming out of the, the fog of COVID then. Um, so I didn't really know how to pitch this talk, so I just did anything. <laughs> so apologies if this isn't quite what you're expecting. Um, for instance, here's my dog. Um, I love my dog. Um, <clears throat> so she's a big part of my life, um, as are my children, but they would not tolerate being put up on that screen. <laughs> um, I like lots of things like we all do. I, I, I like stupid jokes, and this is stupid, and it's, it involves jokes. Um, when I first started working in sort of stats area, a few years ago now, um, somebody said that to me and I thought that summed up just about everybody I've ever met who works in the data science space. Um, so I was just wondering who was in the room um, today? Uh, lecturers? Um, <clears throat> computer science lecturers? Any computer science lecturers? Yeah, yeah, stats. Um, anybody from the sort of IT, ICT department? No? Nope. So, sort of a hard, hardcore science. <laughs> <laughs> um, students, any students here today? Thank you for coming during your study break, that's awesome. Industry? Great. Um, <clears throat> do you want to just shout out maybe where you're from? Contact. Yeah. Same. Contact energy. Yeah. Agree with that. Agri research. Agri research, lovely. Any other? Waka Kotahi. Tesla. Tesla. Okay, see. Welcome. Anyone else? ESR. ESR? Yeah, I like your data. Okay. Um, so I thought I might talk about, we've got some students in the room, talk about maybe our typical career path in data science that we might expect. Um, looks something like this. You decide you want to be a data scientist. You uh, <coughs> do a STEM degree, and then you do your postgrad, and then you maybe intern somewhere, and then you become a graduate data science, scientist, somewhere really cool. And then you decide that ML ops is where it's at, so you become an AI engineer, and you work somewhere cool like Google. Then you get into NLP, it's somewhere like OpenAI. This is how this is how it's going to happen, right? <laughs> then you enter your billionaire phase, <laughs> and you have an AI startup. This one's lingu LinguaBot Innovations, but it could be anything. And then you exit at 25, and you invest in crypto. <laughs> but this is my career path in data science, which I present to you as an alternate route. I don't think you need to copy it exactly, but it looks <laughs> something like this. I wanted to be a diplomat, so I did a BA and an MA. Then I didn't get to be a diplomat, so I entered the uh, slope of despair, which is your 20s. I did some jobs, and I thought, hey, I, I want to be a journalist. So I did a journalism qualification, but then it turns out journalism really sucks. You got paid $15,000 a year as a cadet. It wasn't enough to live on, so it, it really you had to have rich parents who were going to support you. So I just got another job, and eventually I became an investigator at the Commerce Commission, which was great. I thought, yes, I'm going to get into computer forensics, but then I had a baby. <laughs> so I thought, hey, I'm going to help children. I'm going to, I'm going to become a maths teacher. So I did some, went back and did my high school maths all over again, and that was the vibe at the time with a baby. But then I had another baby. So I entered what I call the fog of parenthood, and I just did stuff. And I'll talk about the stuff in a little bit. Um, but at some point amongst doing all the stuff, I thought maybe I could combine like the maths and the journalism and become a data journalist. So I thought I'd study to be a data scientist and I kind of stuck at that. Did a BSc, did a job, did a little bit of lecturing, decided I could, should have a postgrad degree if I'm going to be lecturing. And now I've got the job I've got now at Orion Health. Just want to zero in on this stuff. Um, I think you can get carried away, uh, especially as a stay-at-home mother, um, by other people's interests and in what you should be doing. 
and um, a lot of people will say, you'd be really good at admin. I think you should go file stuff for a living and you think, I don't, I don't really think that's like the peak of my uh, powers is, is filing stuff. But um, <clears throat> I quite liked this quote at the time when people were telling me how to live my life by Ursula Le Guin, which was um, just about you know, choosing your own direction and choosing to do you know, later in life a course like this um, in data science is um, you know, part of doing that. You're choosing your own direction. You, you, you're, you're making your own destiny. You're not letting other people do it for you. Around the same time, I discovered this concept, Greek concept techni, which is really about how, when I was doing my stuff, a lot of it was volunteering and giving back. And uh, it wasn't really, I, mean, I was doing things like delivering pamphlets and stuffing envelopes and organizing volunteers. And none of that was really, I felt, the core skills that I was particularly good at. I'm not good at admin, as it turns out. Um, so the idea behind techni is that you develop a skill to the best of your abilities that, that you can then apply. And in doing so, you serve your community in some way, the best way that you can. So, you know, be a little bit selfish in order to give back. So I chose health data science as my domain, um, which I think fits into that whole concept of techni, I've retrained. I'm giving back through uh, doing something that will be of benefit to patients, clinicians, and also to the health system in general. Um, where I work is Ryan Health. It's a New Zealand um, company. It's been around for 30 years. We have offices all over the world, but we are based mainly in Auckland. Um, this is the product suite of the company that I work at. So there's a, a patient-facing part of our product suite, a, a clinician-facing part. So that's the digital front door and the digital care record. And where our work is in the part of the business that underlies those things, which is the health intelligence platform. I work in the AI team, and we do a lot of different things. These are just some examples. Um, we built a COVID-19 risk of hospitalisation model that was deployed nationally um, to help rank people in terms of priority for contact at the height of the pandemic, well, at least the height of our pandemic. Um, we work with natural language processing. We have a tool for clinical concept coding that we've developed through the Precision Driven Health Partnership. Um, do a lot of modelling using text. Text is huge in health data. Um, we're working on some um, LLM-based AI health assistants. Um, we're working with uh, the Ministry of Health in, on in Ontario for that. Um, I've even done qualitative research and recently had a paper published, which I never thought I'd have a paper published in the qual research space. And we do some work with dashboards as well and many other things. This is the team I joined. They were very uh, decorated when I joined. It was quite intimidating. Um, won awards, launched New Zealand's Algorithm Hub, which is a world first national um, model management solution that Tafata Order has licensed as part of their um, <clears throat> platform. These are some of the clients that I've worked with in the past couple of years. It's quite varied. Leave it up there for a second, I won't read them all out. And uh, in terms of my day to day, um, I, do, I was hired as a data science consultant, so I do do a bit of consulting around data science requirements. Um, I do business development, um, I manage the team now, um, the data science team, and I'm uh, still doing some coding type work, some project management, and then the bits that are around professional development at the end there. Um, I thought I'd talk about, for students, what successful data science teams are. And when you do you know, team projects, you get to see all sorts of behaviours, especially as an older student. In fact, one um, person asked me my age, and I said it. And she said, oh, you're the same age as my mum. <laughs> and I said, how old's your mum? And she said, I don't know, 43. I was like, oh, I'm older than your mum. <laughs> So that was very, that was fun. It was fun being that, that old lady in the, uh, in the computer science uh, project team. Um, but uh, one thing I would, from that experience and from what I've experienced in industry that I'd really like to highlight is that there are, it's a cliche, but there are no unicorns. Data science teams, they collaborate and they're really, really diverse. And that's um, the most, if there's any message you take away from me today as a student, um, I, that would be my, my, key, my key talking point. Um, 
there are a diversity of roles out there. You don't have to be exactly a data science to work in a, a data scientist to work in a data science team. Lots of different roles that come together in um, a team like mine. My team looks like this. These are the roles that we have in our team. Um, I'm down the bottom there. Um, we've got engineer type roles, NL an NLP specialist, um, so a really diverse set of roles. Um, in terms of education, they actually are most PhD, mostly PhDs. The ornithology, I got that wrong, that's actually ecology with birds. So I thought it was ornithology, it's not. Um, so it's quite diverse. Um, and in terms of demographics, really diverse as well. Um, just a couple of us from New Zealand. Could be more women. So my observations as a trainee data scientist here at Auckland, and also I spent some time at Massey University as well, is that there are really not many Māori or Pacifica students, especially in computer science. And um, women are, particularly in computer science, underrepresented, um, maybe less so in stats. Not many older people. And I kind of feel like this is an area where we do want older people to be pivoting to and training in. And um, <clears throat> there was just one other woman I came across who was over 40 and training to be a data scientist, and that was me, and that's a really bad joke. Um, there are a couple of people in undergrad that I came across at Massey, but generally um, not many people um, <clears throat> over 40. Uh, the context is that New Zealand is desperate for skilled tech staff and that diversity is critical for our tech sector's future. Um, Māori, Pacifica, female, women underrepresented um, in New Zealand's tech industry still. Um, so the question I've sort of had in my mind all the way through ever since I started training and, and also teaching in data science was how could we support cohort diversity better? And um, I think we really need to find ways to make part-time study really attractive, particularly if you're in a marginalised group. Um, Part-time's your only option. So we need to think about how we do that. Um, we need to recognise achievement in our part-time students as well as our full-time students. And we really need to bend over backwards to accommodate diverse backgrounds. Um, we can think about scholarships. Scholarships generally are targeted at younger people studying full time. I know there are some scholarships out there that are, uh, well, at least now there's, I think there's one that's targeted at women going back into the workforce after having a family, but um, there's not really a lot out there. I was fine, I had support at home, but I know that's a huge barrier for a lot of people going back into the workforce. Um, the Dean's List is for people who study full time. And if you are um, Māori or Pacifica and you have to study part-time, then you're sort of excluded from those kinds of, um, that kind of recognition. So we need to think about how we can change that. Uh, more practical assistance. When I first started coming here, I didn't, I think I was doing two papers a semester, and I didn't qualify for a bus discount as a result. But I was still coming in five days a week because my lectures were five days a week. So how can we support people to come in, to actually physically be here? Um, we need to think about that. You know, what does that entail? Bus discounts is a really easy thing that we can um, put into place. We need to provide opportunities for all backgrounds. We recently had an intern on our team who was, um, had been 10 years a data scientist but was doing the Master of um, IT here, I think. So I had to come up with something for him to do on our team that was totally new for him, because he already had 10 years experience, but his degree required of him that he had to do an internship, and I know that's not like this in the data science program, which is great, but we just need to think about, in general, in the university, how in tech, that how we can um, tailor our opportunities so that they're really appropriate for people of all levels of experience and backgrounds. I think apprenticeships is something we could start thinking about. Um, <clears throat> getting people involved um, working in data science um, or in tech, maybe just in, in tech more generally, um, straight out of school and training them from there. That's something we could think about. People need to earn money sometimes from the age of 18. Um, they need to be able to see themselves in these roles as well. And at 18, it's really hard to see yourself as like a data science at 23, 24, when you don't have those role models at home or around you. 
um, less mentoring, more system change. Um, women are doing really well. <laughs> Thank you very much. They're capable, they're educated. They don't need mentors. We just need the system to change around us. So, um, I mean, mentoring's great, but it's not an answer. Okay. I'll leave you with one last piece of advice, and this is for uh, the students who are in the room. And uh, this comes from the heart. And that is that success looks like <laughs> turning up to class in person. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we've, um, we're seeing, and I know my, my husband's business, they're seeing, he works in consulting, that this, the graduates coming through there is a decrease in quality, and we are drawing a line between that and online learning. And online learning is great, right? I'm talking about supporting diversity. Online learning is great because it means that all sorts of people can access learning from home. However, if you can turn up to class in person, you should. And I won't go into all the reasons why. Ask your lecturers why it's a good idea. <laughs> all right, well, that's me. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Um, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Can I take you to my classes? <laughs> that slide. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that slide. <laughs> but I, I hear it's easy to make yourself. Uh, describe briefly the nature of your uh, research and qualitative research. Qualitative. Oh, yes. So that was we were investigating. Precision medicine solutions, we were looking at this concept called patients like, we wanted to call it patients like me, but Epic had already stolen, taken that. So we were calling it patients like this, and this sort of data-driven insights into patients for clinicians. So uh, the idea is that when a, like in the oncology context, when a patient asks you, you know, what does the future look like for me? You can say, well, actually, um, these are the stats, but this is what the future looked like for these people that we've got access, where we have access to their data, who are like you. And before we even got into that, we realised that we needed to, we wanted to have a patient-focused approach, and also that we needed to understand whether patients even wanted that. You know, do they want that? Is that useful to them? Um, what context would that, it be useful in? We, oncology in the end. So the paper was about um, patient and clinician's perspectives on using um, dashboards for shared decision making around their treatment and care. Yeah, okay. Um, good question. Python and some Python and then some Python. <laughs> and then in the rest of the business, it's JavaScript. <laughs> so we're, we're a little bit different. Yeah, some Python too, and also a tiny bit of R, depending on whether Luke Boyle is on the job or not. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes? Do you have any comment about I'll just wait for the door to stop squeaking so I can hear you. Do I have any comment about... Oh, remote working. Yeah, that's sort of a good thing and a bad thing. Like, when people are sick, I love people working from home. <laughs> um, it's really awesome. But um, <clears throat> we actually have a policy where you have to be in Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday at work, and you can choose to remote work on the other two days. Um, Interestingly, the office can be quite quiet on some of those days, and certainly our grad didn't turn up today, <laughs> and so he must be at home. He didn't say a word. So um, I think uh, there's a balance to be had. There's some really good reasons why we should maintain some flexibility, but um, collaboration is certainly enhanced through physical presence, particularly for the people coming through university now who have done a lot of it online, they need that concept. They need to build up those skills. Yeah. Can you say a little bit why you wanted to become a math teacher, particularly the math part for your, for your children? 
for ma why I wanted to do math. Yeah. You know, it was because I was really good at maths at school. <laughs> and, and then I went, on, I went to uh, open day at the university for engineering. And it was called Ingenuity Day. It was for young women to get them into engineering. And this woman in full motorcycle leathers and a, a mohawk mullet, because this was 1992, um, took us down to the bottom of the engineering building and put a banana in dry ice and then smashed it with a hammer. And that was our demonstration. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be an engineer. <laughs> And then I went and did a, a, a polit political studies, <laughs> which was a bad idea <laughs> for somebody who was good at maths so, and really bad at social studies at school. So um, I, I think it was just an unfinished, I knew that was what I was good at. And I, I, I wanted to cycle back to that. And also teaching seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. But do you feel that, like, especially with math, and high school, and this is something that we could focus on also working together with schools to, you know, get pe more people Interesting. from more diverse backgrounds into this area? Yeah, yeah, I feel like you're leading into something. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> that, that, that was my opening question. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Yeah, so, um, yeah, why not? I mean, I think uh, to get young people into tech, you've got to start really young. And I don't think it necessarily requires doing, learning how to code in Python when you're 13. But having the maths, having the foundational um, skills and being able to see yourself as somebody who could do that role and that it's a role worth doing is, is really, really important. And I despair at, um, you know, when I was here, I remember I had a couple of lectures down around the arts buildings and I was like, oh, that's where all the women are. Like, there were all these women down there that weren't up here. And, um, yeah, I just feel like there's, there's more that we could do. I just don't, I don't really know what the real answer is, but it needs to start earlier rather than later. Yeah. Would, would, would have to start with a positive view towards mathematics and not uh, something that nerds all need to do. Absolutely. And this whole idea that I, I can't do maths is such rubbish. Yes. Yeah, it's such rubbish. Anybody can do maths. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, quite an interesting diverse background you have. Um, I was wondering, like, in the success in your current role, how much do you attribute it to the training in data science itself versus the journey that your career took you through? Ah, hard to untangle that. I think it's both. But I think I made a deliberate choice to train here because I knew it was a, a, I'd get a quality degree here and it would be thorough and it would be rigorous. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I couldn't have done it without <laughs> training. But um, I wouldn't have been as uh, rounded without the experience. But, I mean, it takes all sorts of people um, to do to do data science, and that was just one way, yeah. Yeah, you sort of hit the nail on the head when you say that team is a unicorn rather than one person. Yes. So sort of, uh, your team around that. Yeah, yeah. We all bring different, in my team, we all have totally different strengths and weaknesses, and we all just, it all just works, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Thank you for listening.